Hello, I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's lecture. My name is Brian White and I'm chair of the Stanford Mathematics Department. This lecture is one in a series of public lectures organized by Stanford's Mathematics Research Center and by the Friends of Stanford Mathematics. If you would like to be notified of future events and are not on our mailing list, drop me a line at chair at math.stanford.edu and we'd be happy to add you to our list. This evening, we are very fortunate to have as our speaker, Professor Peter Sarnak. Professor Sarnak is one of the world's most distinguished mathematicians, particularly in number theory, though he's worked in a variety of fields, including mathematical physics. He did his undergraduate work in South Africa, and he received his PhD here in Stanford in 1980 under the direction of Paul Cohen. He's been professor at many institutions, including Stanford. He's currently a professor at Princeton University and a permanent member of the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. Professor Sarnak has won numerous awards for his mathematical work, including the Polio Prize of the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics, the Konop Prize of the American Math Society, the Ostrovsky Prize, the Cole Prize of the American Math Society, the Ford Prize of the Mathematical Association of America, and, just last year, the Wolf Prize in Mathematics. He's been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Science, the American Philosophical Society, and he's a fellow, fellow of the Royal Society. Professor Sarnak has served as PhD advisor to nearly 50 students, and we are very fortunate to have two of those students, Akshay Venkatesh and Kanan Sounderarajan, as professors here at Stanford. Please join me, join me in welcoming Professor Sarnak. Thank you for the <coughs> kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here and looking at all familiar faces, old friends, some teachers who know how little I know uh, from many years ago. And uh, to be honest, I don't know why I left this place, but I did. <laughs> it's a great place and the department is uh, really a great department today. So I've chosen as my topic here uh, for a public lecture sums of squares, and I want to show you that a topic as old as sums of squares is, I'm going to use this thing and move around, is perhaps, this works, uh, is still of great interest and even quite useful or potentially of great use, and that's the Golden Gates, which I'll get to roughly uh, 40 minutes into this lecture. By the way, I've just been coached by two young Akshay Venkatesh was mentioned, and Brown Conrad, as to how to give a lecture. Now, I've given millions of lectures, but apparently uh, they weren't very good, so I was coached right now, <laughs> and we'll see if I do any better. Okay, so sums of squares. I'm going to introduce you to a guy called Carl Ludwig Siegel, a very intimidating guy. looks there like he's playing with his cell phone. I think he's actually uh, lighting a pipe. This is not a man who, everybody was very scared of this guy, including Atlas Selberg, who was his colleague at the Institute, and I once asked him, uh, do you think that he would have been interested in what I did? And he said, I would never have asked him the time of day I was so scared of him. <laughs> but he looked very jolly there, playing with something, and I had never been able to tell exactly what it was. And he writes this in 1934 in a book uh, in which he introduced a very famous formula called the Siegel Mass Formula that I'll try to explain a little bit of. And he says, it is somewhat surprising that in a branch of mathematics as old as the theory of quadratic forms, which originated amongst the ancient Babylonians as, and has been intensively studied during the last three centuries by a succession of mathematicians of the highest rank, including Fermat, Gauss, Jacobi, and Minkowski, that, that any fundamentally new ideas have been left to be discovered. Nevertheless, it is our aim in these lectures to present a new general theorem in the arithmetic theory of quadratic forms which has several important applications. That's an understatement. This revolutionized <clears throat> many things. Something called the birch when and dyer conjecture was born very nat naturally out of this. But let me start at the beginning and discuss uh, these fellows, Fermat, Gauss, I won't say anything about Jacobi really, and Minkowski. So, since there's a general audience, and as my younger fellows uh, explained to me, I should explain 
from the very beginning some things at least. Uh, so this is now some experimental writing, that's my handwriting by the way, uh, in which this was before Fermat, I'm going to tell you a theorem of Fermat, but this is something that you would discover if you were a young person, and some young people here may discover this by seeing this for the first time, or if they went home and played a little bit. We're interested in which numbers can be written as a sum of two squares. This lecture I will restrict to sums of squares. In particular, let me start with a prime number. A prime is one which is divisible only by itself, and one. And let, let's say the numbers are positive right now. Most of the numbers that I'll talk about all the time are positive. So I'm going to try to write P as a sum of two squares. Uh, we'll return to why this is an interesting question, but this is an example of a Diophantine equation to be solved over the whole numbers. Now, it is very, it's much more difficult to understand equations over the whole numbers. It's easy to raise them. But to actually answer this kind of question is much more difficult because you don't invent the numbers. You don't, can't invent complex numbers. You want to answer the question within the whole numbers. And m many fields in mathematics are devel were developed in order to answer these kind of questions, and they are used. So if we want to understand something in the whole numbers, we'll have to understand in, uh, what happens when we uh, look at uh, remainders when divided by another number and finite fields and many, many other things. So it becomes quite demanding, though the questions are always elementary. So which numbers are sum of two squares? Which primes? So two can be written as one squared plus one squared. Three, you can look, well, there are only a few options for x1 and x2, and it is not a sum of two squares. Five is two squared plus one squared. Seven is not a sum of two squares. And if you go down here with the primes, there seems to be a pattern developing that if you, get, if you give any of these p's and they give remainder three when divided by four, then no solutions. And if they give remainder one when divided by four, there seems to be solutions. We find solutions. And you go all the way up to 100, and this pattern persists. And if you see a pattern like this, the, one of the beauties of mathematics is it's a very concrete and experimental subject. You might believe it's true. And before Fermi, this I'm sure was expected. I'm not sure the exact history. But Fermi basically proves this. So let me state his theorem in a minute. But the most important thing that I want you to remember from here is, let's quickly prove this, that if you give remainder three, if P gives remainder three when divided by four, which I will now, from now on, describe as being congruent to three modulo four, that's the same as saying gives remainder three when divided by four, then you can't get, then you cannot write P as a sum of two squares. And that's because if you take any, the remainders mod four, or zero squared is zero, one squared is one, two squared, is four, which is zero, three squared is one. So the only options are zero and one, and if I add two of those, I'll get zero plus zero is zero, zero plus one is one, one plus one is two, but I'll never get three. So it's immediate that the easy side here is there's a local, I'll call it local, obstruction for writing a prime P, which gives remainder three when divided by four is a sum of two squares. It just cannot be done by, by this elementary consideration. These elementary considerations look complicated if you've never seen them before, but you have to take my word for that. That's much easier than finding whole number solutions. Finding whole number solutions is difficult. So the converse, that if P is congruent to one mod four, it gives remainder one when divided by four, then it's always a sum of two squares. That's a miracle. That takes a proof, and that's highly non-trivial. And that's th one, of the one of the many theorems of this man called Fermat, and that's what Siegel was referring to when he said that these people answered some of these questions. So his theorem is that you can solve P as a sum of two squares, if and only if, that means it's true and only true, when P gives remainder one when divided by four. P is an odd prime. That's a remarkable theorem, and let me repeat that when P is congruent to one mod four, we have to find X and Y, and there's no easy formula for it. And in fact, I will return to this when I return to quantum computation as to how quickly we can find the solution. It becomes important. Can you find X and Y quickly? That becomes an important thing. Now, Fermi actually proved much more. If I want to write M as a sum of two squares, not just a prime as a sum of two squares, then there's always going to be this local, what we call local analysis, which is to look at division, remainders when I work modulo Q. And that, as I say, is an elementary thing, and only finitely many cues come into this. This is something that algebra can handle quite easily. 
So it's a necessary condition that if I'm going to solve this in whole numbers, which is our main starting interest, then I can also solve it in arithmetic modulo Q. That's immediate. So that's a necessary condition, and the world would be marvelous if that was sufficient. So if you can solve the thing in congruences, that means it's locally solvable in congruences for every Q, something that's not difficult to check for the prime Pete with just this one condition that we gave before, and otherwise it uh, will involve the factors of M. I'd first have to factor M into its primes. But they're easy to check, and the theorem of Fermi is that you can solve this if and only if you can solve it locally. And this is the first of all local to global principles in the theory of numbers. And, and the local to global principle is something very much desired in all of mathematics, because sometimes you can solve something calculus locally, and then you want to understand that there's a global solution. And this already comes up in this problem, and it's the converse that's always difficult. And everything I'll say will be trying to prove the converse. I'm interested in finding solutions, not showing there are no solutions. There are great films about there are no solutions to Diophantine equations, but I'm a much more positive guy than that. I want to find solutions. <laughs> and so when there should be solutions, can we find them? All right, that was the sum of two squares, and now let's, that was Fermat. Let's look at the next case, which is much more difficult. And I'll, it's got a nice history to it. Which numbers are sums of three squares? Uh, now, you probably, some of you will know that every positive number is a sum of four squares. That's a famous theorem of Lagrange, and that's elementary, and that you will find, and Brian Conrad brought me all the relevant books in all elementary number theory books. For example, this one by Levesque. But three squares you will find in very few elementary number theory books, because it's already quite a bit more difficult. But let's go through the experiment again. Let's try to find the pattern. So now I'm trying to write a number as a sum of three squares. Unlike before, there, will be, there may be many ways I can write m as a sum of three squares. One condition on m is that it better be non-negative because a square of an integer is a non-negative number. So that's an uh, obstruction that you would call an Archimedean obstruction, just like there was an obstruction when I worked modulo 4 previously. So one is the sum of three squares, two, these, there's the solutions, you can check it, I don't think I miscalculated, but you come to seven, there's no solution. And you come to 15, there's no solution. And in fact, if you look at this table, you see any number that gives remainder seven when divided by eight has got a problem. So again, we have a local obstruction, and let's go through that quickly. So I'm looking now modulo eight, not modulo four. So I'm doing arithmetic in remainders when divided by eight, which is now a finite set, which is a much more elementary thing to worry about. And the squares are zero squared is zero, one squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is one again, and you go through and you'll get just zero, one, and four. Those are the only possible values for the squares, and if I add three of those, I'll never get seven modulo eight. So no number which gives remainder seven when divided by eight can be a sum of three squares, and that's why there are no solutions. Also, 28 is a bit of a singularity in this table because it doesn't fit quite that pattern, but all the other ones have solutions, and the dot, dot, dot means there are other solutions. It's not just one solution. And when M gets larger, we might expect there are quite a few solutions. That's why it might be easy to prove, maybe even combinatorially. Anyway, the theorem, proved by none other than Gauss, who Ziegel was referring to, is that there's only one congruence obstruction. Ignore that a second. If I give remainder 7 when divided by 8, so this is a number of the form 8b plus 7 gives remain seven, remainder 7 when I divide by 8. And there's also a slight complication that was the number 28, that any number of the form 4 to the 8 times 8b plus 7 is never a sum of 3 squares. And this was known to Fermat and to uh, Legendre, but it took the genius of Gauss to prove it, and I'll say a word about it now. And this is as good as a local to global principle gets. It tells you exactly which numbers are sums of three squares. If and only if the local congruence obstruction is met. This holds as long as it's not of this form. And that's the only possible thing intervening. And it's only intervening for simple reasons, modulo 7 and 4 to the A. OK, this is not in elementary books. I'll show you exactly what he proved, which is very close to this in a second. And every some n positive numbers are sum of four squares. The more numbers you add, the easier it is to write the numbers as sum of squares. So three is interesting. Two was hard. Not every number is a sum of two squares. Three, it's already just missing, but a local to global principle. Four is easy. 
All right, that's the theorem of Gauss. Now, what Gauss actually proved at the same time, and he took this opportunity, this, the this theorem meant a lot to him. In fact, in his diary, he enters the following on July 10th, 1796. Eureka, num equals sum of three triangles. What he's saying is every positive number is a sum of three triangular numbers. And this was something everybody was after, and in particular, Legendre had claimed that he proved it, but Gauss, who knew that people like me would be lecturing 250 years later, giving credit to him, takes task to point out all the mistakes in Legendre's work here, including various things that he assumes to prove this, like there are infinitely many primes in a progression and something called reciprocity that Gauss was the first to prove. And he points out as much as we might believe these things are true, and there's no doubt they're true, he doesn't have a proof. I'm the first to prove it. So it's good to see this guy fighting over such a theorem. It seems to be one of his most proud moments. Eureka. Uh, I'm doing this out of memory, and my memory is getting bad. I used to, I didn't go back and check, but my memory is that in this entry, at the end of the entry, he says, oh, by the way, my fifth kid was born today. <laughs> it's a much more minor thing than proving this theorem. So every positive number is a sum of three triangular numbers. There are no local obstructions, you see, unlike sums of squares. So I think the way these guys were thinking of it is if you write a number as a sum of squares, which is the title of the talk, so I should look at all angles on it, is you would write down a square, which has got a square number of numbers, if it's got size n and n, and then write n as in 1 squared plus n 2 squared plus n 3 squared. That's the sum of squares. Every, that we dis discuss which numbers are sum of 3 squares. Well, then they asked, suppose I took other regular gons, like a triangle, so the number of uh, dots in a triangle like this is n into n plus 1 over 2 rather than n squared. It's still a quadratic expression in n, but it's not homogeneous anymore. And now, all of a sudden, if you work modulo uh, 8, which was the problem, 7 mod 8, all of a sudden there's no local obstructions, and the beauty is now every positive number is a sum of three numbers of this shape. And he gave a proof of that and an ingenious proof, elementary proof. Gauss would always, his proofs were all elementary and they were always to the point, the right concept. And he was the first to prove both that and the sum of three squares. Uh, if you look at other regular gons, people have asked since many questions, in particular Jean Legendre, who he was complaining about in a later book in 1830. This is, Gauss published uh, his Disquestiones. This is the book in which you will find his attack on Legendre on page, in section 151, if you're interested. Uh, he proved that if you take hexagonal numbers, which is a sub, you can show as a subsequence of that, that he, they didn't find any local obstructions for writing any large number or any number as a sum of three hexagonal numbers, which is the number of numbers in a hexagon, which is this number. There's no local obstruction for three, and Legendre is able to prove that any number which is bigger than 1791 is the sum of four hexagonal numbers. And there are many numbers less than 1791, small numbers, which are not sums of four. They require five or six. But we now take a new viewpoint, and we ask what happens when the numbers are large. Maybe there's some finite number of exceptions, and we have to live with those. But when the number's large, if there's no local obstruction, is the number, in fact, the sum of three hexagonal numbers? And this was a much, much more difficult problem, and it was only solved in 1990 by Henrik Ivanich, William Duke, who were both here at Stanford when they solved this, by the way. They were visiting in the summer. We used to have people come here, Joe Keller will remember, every summer. Uh, and uh, this was one of the great summers. William Duke was finishing his thesis, and Henrik Ivanich came with a sp spectacular new idea in the theory of modular forms, and later Schulze Pilot joined them and proved the following, and a whole bunch of other theorems with it, that every sufficiently large integer is a sum of three hexagonal numbers. So there are no local obstructions, and wow, you can find three numbers. The proof is very convoluted, so convoluted that the proof is ineffective, and I want to tell you what that means, because this uh, makes many people worry. What really did you prove? Some people became intuitionists after this. The ineffectivity here would be easily removed if you proved something called the Riemann hypothesis, but we don't know that. So this is, a, this is just a hiccup. Somebody will prove the Riemann hypothesis, generalized, and this will not be there as a hiccup. But right now it's a hiccup. What's really proved is every sufficiently large number, and you can write down what it means. So every number bigger than 10 to the 100. I've never worked out what number works here, and nor did they. 
But any number bigger than 10 to the 100, now all the numbers less than 10 to the 100 are of minor interest. You can go on a machine and look. Maybe quite <laughs> not easy, but that's a separate issue. So every sufficiently large number, and that number can be written down. Every sufficiently large number is a sum of three pentagonal numbers. So every, big, every number bigger than 10 to the 100 says the sum of three pentagonal numbers, except possibly for one. That's the theorem. That's the real theorem. Now think what that means. Nobody, there is no counterexample, but the theorem takes that one bad guy and says there isn't a second bad guy. So you never know if there's one bad guy or not, but the number of exceptions is finite. But the proof is in principle ineffective. It's not that you're lazy. And the minute you see a proof like this, you know that our friend Siegel was there with his cell phone. <laughs> it's a theorem of Siegel that's used, which is at the source of this ineffectivity. So they did something else, eventually combined it with the theorem of Siegel, and this remarkable theorem is proved, which I think would have blown Gauss's mind. And this is 1990. Now, uh, what Siegel was really trying to solve, and I'm going to describe what Siegel's mass formula is, and I, uh, I beg you to bear with me for two technical slides because I want to give you the flavor of the formula. He was working on the 11th problem of Hilbert. As you all know, the first problem of Hilbert, Hilbert posed 23 problems, which really impacted 20th century mathematics, and the very first problem was solved by our own Paul Cohen. Uh, the 11th problem is what Siegel was very interested in, in working on sums of squares, and the pro problem is not formulated in terms of sums of squares, but what are called quadratic forms. He wanted to understand, when I have a quadratic equation, so sums of squares, but there could be cross terms, more general, but this is how he formulates it, Siegel. And he wants to be able to know, given the work of Fermat and people like that, and Gauss, and Smith actually, which numbers can, for, can you solve this equation as long as there are no local obstruction? Is there a local to global principle in the sense of if there's congruence obstructions, we know we can't solve it, but if there's no congruence obstruction, no arithmetic modulo Q that divulges that there's a good reason you can't solve it, then you hopefully can solve it. So we call that a local to global principle, and he wanted to know, can you develop a local to global principle and he asked it more generally. Now, he wasn't just working with ordinary integers, and here I'm going to allow just a slight generalization of ordinary integers, because this will play a very important role in the quantum gates that I want to spend time on. And there's no watch here, or watch, or clock, or whatever you call it. And I don't know how to operate my cell phone, so I have to press a button. Okay. <laughs> It'd be good if I knew what my time was. All right, so... Um, so he asked the same question where the integers are replaced by integers in, and I'll just describe one kind of number field, and the second kind of question is where you solve the equation where you're allowing rational numbers, so Q stands for rash, ordinary rationals, Z stands for ordinary integers, and a Diophantine equation is usually either you're solving over the rationals, that's one kind of Diophantine equations, or, or you're solving over the integers, that's another di Diophantine equation. The integers are usually much more difficult to find solutions, of course. And that's the question we're asking here, except we're going to allow ourselves a slightly more complicated object. So instead of just looking at A and B ordinary rational numbers, I'm going to allow A plus B times root 2, where A and B are rational numbers. If you take two such numbers and you add them, you get a, a number which is of that form. If you multiply two such numbers, you again get a number of that form. And they form what's called a field, and the field looks very much like the rational numbers, and it's got a divisibility theory that goes just like the integers have. And the integers in this field, ooh, the integers in this field uh, or just the numbers a plus b root 2, where a and b are ordinary integers. So they are number rings, and this is the context in which Hilbert's 11th problem was asked. Just like with complex numbers, if, a, if I have a complex number a plus b times i, its complex conjugate is a minus b times i, there's a similar notion here. Alpha primed is the conjugate of alpha. It will be important if I'm trying to work out which numbers are sums of squares in this number ring. So this is the question of... Uh, Hilbert and Siegel was trying to solve this. Now, this problem, in terms of solving it over the rationals, was solved quite brilliantly, and Ziegl, uh, Hilbert already pointed to the way you're going to solve this. 
he, in, he had the rudiments of what's called class field theory, and this was used by this man called Hasse, after Minkowski, who had understood these things over the rational numbers, to understand a complete local to global principle for solving over the rationals. And that was that if you can solve it locally, you can solve it globally, and I won't tell you what local and global means here for these fields, but it's a very famous theorem in mathematics. And in fact, many people think that that's the complete solution of Hilbert's problem. But that's because they haven't looked at the problem. The problem actually is very much directed towards integers, and this is what Siegel was trying to do. So the Hass famous Hasse-Minkowski theorem tells you what happens over the rationals of these quadratic number rings that we're talking about. Okay, so now I'm going to try to tell you what the Siegel mass formula is because it explains the luck that Fermat, Gauss, and Legendre, uh, Lagrange had and why they were successful. And there are very few cases in which you can have such an easy life and why the general problem is hard and Siegel set out to solve it and I'll show you the solution eventually. So this idea which, uh, sorry, I'm not good at this. Uh, this idea, which uh, goes back to at least Gauss, is if you want to understand which numbers are represented by your quadratic form f, maybe f is a sum of squares, if I make a change of variable, I, th I replace x by a times x, where a is just a matrix, just an ordinary change of variable, and that matrix is invertible, and the inverses are integers, then whatever number f represents, because if I change here, I'll just go from integers to integers. G and F will represent the same numbers. So you should break up the quadratic forms that you're trying to understand into classes where they all can be moved one into the other by just this linear change of variable. And that, bre that breakup turns out to be into a finite set. So F and G, if they are globally equivalent, as we call it, will represent the same number. And the genus of a form, so this is one of the highlights in Siegel's book that he was talking about, is that the set of quadratic forms uh, under this equivalence of change of variable, integral change of variable, breaks up into inequivalent classes, into classes, and each class, of course, each form in the class, all members in a class are the same over the integers, so they, if they're globally equivalent, but if I'm looking at these classes just locally, they may not be globally equivalent. So the genus of a form is the set of all forms which look locally incongruences, where now instead of just uh, solving in arithmetic modulo q, I'm allowed to do matrix manipulations modulo q. That's the only difference. And if the two forms are locally the same, we say they're in the same genus. And it turns out the genus has got only finitely many forms, and the number of forms in the genus is called this famous class number. It's the theorem of Hermit that that's finite, uh, maybe also Minkowski. And Siegel's mass formula says, and this is the remarkable formula that he proved in this book, it was a highlight of the book, is that if R, F, J of M is the number of ways of representing the number M by the quadratic form F, J, you should think of F, J as sum of three squares, for example, then this is a difficult problem. How many times M is represented by an individual F, J may be difficult, but there is a mass, a sum of an average sum that if you sum the number of representations of M over the genus with some God-given weights that you compute before you start, independent of M, then everything that you get on the right-hand side of this formula is given purely in terms of local information, purely in terms of congruence analysis. So the right-hand side is easy, and the left-hand side is unfortunately not just telling you how many solutions there are, but some weighted sum. And that's the famous Siegel mass formula, and many generalizations of that for other equations other than quadratics. The generalization of that to cubic equations is called the birch swinnett and Dyer conjecture, born directly out of trying to generalize this numerically with the first uh, uh, um, arrival of, of computers at Cambridge. So this is this mass formula. It's a fantastic formula. And it's particularly good if the, the class number is 1, because then on the left, you just have the number of representation, and you have a local to global principle. And that's the miracle of Gauss, Fermat, and uh, Lag uh, Lagrange, is that these things, by some miracle, have one class in the genus. So these forms are extremely special. Any other form of any other field, this thing fails. So they had found more or less the few finite cases in which there's one class in the genus, and you have a complete story. You can look locally, and you get the answer globally with, now, with this Siegel fantastic formula. 
But Ziegler wasn't satisfied with this because these are very rare. He found that when any other form you choose, for example, five squares, three squares over a number field, quadratic number field, this will never be true that H is one, and then you're stuck. I'll give you an example of two forms. So what, what his formula will say is every sufficiently large number is represented as it should be by one of these forms, but you don't know which one's doing the job. So if you're lucky enough, you can show each one does the job. That's how we solve all these problems. We show each one shares the burden equally if M gets large. That's really what... And Ziegel himself answered which numbers are sums of squares. I apologize. Uh, some of five squares in a quadratic number field, any number field for that matter. So there's a necessary condition that if M is to be a sum of five squares, then certainly its conjugate must also be because its conjugate will be x1 prime squared. The conjugate goes through these things, as you can easily check. And it will also be a sum of five squares, and so it must also be positive. So a number, a quadratic number, which is both positive and its conjugate are positive, is called totally positive. And that's a necessary condition, and there may be some conditions modulo other numbers, which we can always find. And mo without, uh, Ziegel shows, that as long as M is sufficiently large, there will always be finitely many exceptions, except for these very few cases. But what becomes true is you have a local to global principle for writing a number as a sum of squares as long as M is large. So every number which uh, is supposed to be a sum of five squares is a sum of squ five squares if it's big enough. That's uh, Ziegel's result on this. And it was then extended to four. The fewer variables, the harder the problem. And this was solved for four variables by Knese in 74 with a quite ingenious elementary proof using the pigeonhole principle and Hass's theorem. This was quite a shock that you could do four this way. You can give a proof using much more fancy machinery, something called modular forms and a theorem of Deligne that I think most experts knew, but Hasse found an elementary proof. But for three, it's always been very difficult. So this is a problem that was the solution of Hilbert's 11th problem by Cogdell, Piotrowski, Shapiro, and myself. Also done a lot of it starting with, as I said, Duke, and then having, this was the problem of uh, carrying this out in a number field, w it presented fundamental new ideas, but their ideas were the, the roots of, 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 of achieving this. And of course, all of Ziegel's work. And so the moral of the story is, again, this is ineffective, and I'll give you an example in a minute. Every sufficiently large number is a sum of squares when it's supposed to be, with finitely many exceptions. And we never can say where these exceptions are. The result is ineffective when we're down to three variables. So three is the hardest. I've kept away from two because I'll say a word about it in a second. So here's an example. If you take the numbers A plus B root three, this is another number ring. These are, and you take, this has genus two, the class numbers two, I mean. So there's one form. You're interested which numbers are sum of squares. So I'm now giving an example, very concrete example. Ziegel's formula will say every positive number that's supposed to be a sum of three squares is represented either by this form or that form. We don't know which. The theorem that's proved here will say actually each one will represent it if it's large enough. But I can't tell you what large enough is. I can only tell you this weird statement that once it's bigger than a number that I can write down, then it is good except for one exception. So you may think, gee, that's not very pleasing. So we don't understand this problem completely, and that's the truth. It's not ineffective in a, in a, a, a sort of disastrous nature. As I said, we don't understand something called the Riemann hypothesis, and that's what's holding us back. Okay, I'm going to skip this. I just want to say one word here, that for n equals 2, there's no simple local to global principle. Now, when you have a sum of two squares, x squared plus y squared, for Mars case, you can factorize that as x plus i y times x minus i y, and it be, which you can't do with three or more variables. And that becomes a factorization problem. And there's a beautiful subject that everybody who comes to study at Stanford or Princeton who takes algebraic number theory, the very first thing they learn is class field theory. And that answers exactly this question. And Hilbert, in his 11th problem, his very comment was, in each problem, he would say, what are the relevant references for this problem? Where, I don't know, I mean, he, he came up with good problems, but here, his references are his own paper on what are the beginnings of class field theory. He understood that that was relevant, and Hasse used it. And of course, Ziegel's formula uses it, so everything over here uses it. 
So two is very different. The, uh, the answer is not in terms, except for these ones where H is one, and there are very few of those, class number is always big, and you can't actually work out uh, in terms of simple uh, arithmetic in saying that the numbers which are represented are ones which have some congruence obstructions. That just is not true. It's a much deeper answer. Okay, so that's a history of sums of squares and quadratic forms in Hilbert's 11th problem, which remains not completely solved. And now I want to show you how sums of squares might be used to be build a completely optimal quantum computer. Now, I don't know what a quantum computer is. So <laughs> I'm going to take the mathematical side of it. I'm going to show you what's in every book on quantum computation, which is abstracted by a computer scientist. In other words, I don't know how to build a quantum gate. But what I'm going to show you is if you know something about sums of squares, something quite delicate, but which is, is apparently true, as you'll see, sums of four squares in a particular number field, then apparently we can build, so this is what I want to spend the rest of the lecture on, Apparently, we can build the best gates, completely optimal gates in terms of complexity. So if anybody ever builds a quantum computer, these gates will probably be driving every machine. But whether anybody will build a quantum computer is not something I have any clue about. That, that's a physics problem. You have to build a gate. But suppose somebody gives you these gates. I'm going to show you how to use them, and the key will be a sum of four squares. So in quantum mechanics, we're going to be using unitary matrices. So let me do a little revision here, so we go back to my handwriting. So I'm going to multiply two by two matrices. I hope that's okay. We, uh, we're going to talk about two by two matrices only. So my two by two matrices are A, B, C, D. A, B, and C, D are complex numbers. The complex conjugate of a complex number, if X is real, is X plus I, Y, is X minus I, Y. And a physicist will write A dagger for the adjoint, as the mathematician will write A star, where the, comp uh, the adjoint of a, of a two by two complex matrix is the transpose conjugate. And we multiply two matrices. If you see A star times A or A times B, you multiply row times column like you write, multiply two by two matrices. Now the interesting thing is that the matrices which satisfy A star A equals I, so the, the star times A equals I are called unitary matrices. They are like rotations in the complex numbers. They preserve complex distance, which we'll see in a minute. And the idea in quantum computation and in quantum, a quantum computer is that you'll have some physical operation. One thing about the quantum mechanics is it operates by unitary transformations. Whatever physics, Schrodinger equation, whatever you're running, uh, the, some, you'll have some input and you, the output will be a unitary transformation of what you started off with. And we want to try use that in order to make a computing machine. So I'll be freely using, I'll use freely two by two complex matrices. I'll, this group of two by two matrices such that A star A equals I actually forms a group. The product of two such matrices is again such a matrix. The inverse of such a matrix is such a matrix. That's called a group. And this group is denoted by the unitary group in two variables. It looks simple, but it's already got all the complexities in it. And to build the general universal quantum gate, I'll explain in a second, you need to understand this. Okay. Now, in classical computing, any classical computer is based on bits. The bits are variables which take on 0, 1. And a program or a, a circuit is a function which is a Boolean function. It takes va uh, its arguments are 0, 1 to the n, and it outputs a 0 and a 1. And as you all know with circuits, you can write down any circuit, any Boolean circuit, with some very basic gates called not and or, which are the universal gates for writing down any circuit. And the theory of complexity, which is very important in, in modern computation, what computers offer to us what is not that you can just solve a problem, but that you can solve it quickly. And we'll return to that in a minute. So in complexity theory of Boolean functions, the uh, depth of the circuit or the length there are various measures of the complexity of the circuit. Now, in quantum mechanics, I emphasize theoretical. I'm not telling you how to build a gate. I have no idea. Uh, the single, so this is a mathematical abstraction. Instead of having zero ones as the states, the states are complex vectors in two-dimensional complex space. U1, U2, whose length, so the absolute value of U1 squared plus U2 squared is one. This is some quantum state that the machine that uh, uh, your particle is in. 
And when you measure, then it collapses into a zero or one. Only when you measure do you get a zero or one when you're going to do a quantum computation. But before you measure, there's things in the state. And what you want to do in a quantum computer, you want to build a gate. Now, I'm going to talk about a one-bit quantum gate, not even an n-bit quantum gate, because these are the basic building blocks of the n-bit quantum gate. So what I want is a one-bit quantum gate, and all it is, you realize it somehow physically, it's going to be a, a one-bit quantum gate. Is it just a two-by-two two unitary matrix? Hopefully, you have some experiment which every time you call on this, it'll reproduce the same unitary transformation. It will take this ve uh, vector, which is in some state, this u, and it'll transform it by multiplying a times u, and it'll preserve this property. That's what the unitary matrix preserves. And then you might put it through another gate, and then you move around this u, and if you want to make a computation, you want to be able to put u in any position. You want to do some engineering. This is an engineering problem of where you want to move this vector into any position. Now, you'll only be allowed to build a few gates, and apparently building those gates are extremely difficult. This is what people are trying to do. But suppose you can build a gate. Then when you apply this gate and follow it up by this gate, I'll show you some of the standard gates in a minute, uh, you land up multiplying these matrices. So what happens is you want to try and understand what happens if I multiply a sequence of two-by-two two unitary matrices, matrices. Can I get this matrix to look like close to any other third matrix that I, I would like to come to? So I, now, I, of course, if I just multiply these, say, three, suppose I start off with three two-by-two two matrices and I start multiplying them and forming circuits, they call circuits, I would get a lot of them, but I would just get a finite number after a finite number of steps. I'll never get all unitary matrices, and the all unitary matrices are an uncountable set, this U2. So the, what one has to do here and what one does is one tries to approximate an arbitrary gate by a short circuit in these one-bit quantum gates. So there's a distance, a very natural distance on the space of two by two unitary matrices, which is simply given by this formula, but it's a simple distance between unitary matrices, which is completely natural. It's, uh, in, it's unique in once you put some side conditions, and it's the way we'll measure everything. And a sequence of gates, quantum gates, is called universal, one bit universal, if I can approximate any unitary matrix by a product of these, by these circuits. And one of the most important theorems here is a the famous theorem of Solovey and Kitaev. They proved that you can find, so this uh, was a very important theorem at the beginning of the theory, because the, th the theory was, can a quantum computer actually do as well as a classical computer? It would be kind of a disaster if a quantum computer was not as fast as a classical computer. So this notion of a universal gate set, so a finite number of gates which will allow me to get close to every two by two unitary matrices with short words, with short circuits, was something they showed. They showed that you can do it with short enough circuits in uh, the class of complexity class, polynomial complexity class. So that whatever a classical computer, if you ever built a quantum computer, it could do the same thing as a classical computer with very little slowdown. All right, but the real truth is a quantum computer can do much better than Solovey Kitaev. Ensure, and that's because of sums of squares. So if you open any textbook, all textbooks that I've looked at have the following gates. Now, if you're a famous guy, apparently you get a two by two matrix named after you. <laughs> and the guy is going to be the most famous who gets the identity named after him. <laughs> I don't know how this subject runs, but uh, Hadamard, Adamar, this is the Adamard gate. That's a two by two unitary matrix you can check, and it's one that's been built. The Pauli X gate, Pauli Y gate, this is, here you have some wires going in, you go through this gate, you come out, and you're going to try to change your phase as you move around by applying these gates with short circuits. Now, if you take these H, X, Y, and Z, all the ones which have nice names associated with them, and you multiply those matrices, you never get more than uh, 24 gates. This forms a finite subgroup. In other words, you multiply these, you never exit this 24 set of gates, which apparently, so much so that uh, these are ones that are built, if I understand correctly, and very easy to simulate classically. So those you should view when we start to measure circuit complexity as costing nothing. But they only generate a finite set of two by two matrices, so they'll never be universal. I'll never be able to get to an arbitrary, and the power of a quantum computer is to be able to use 
all the unitary matrices of all sizes, but if we start with one two by two matrices and can do this, it's very easy to build up the general n by n from these pieces. So this is where the action is. And these books, I don't know where they came up with this, but they add something that doesn't have a name because somebody took the square root of this guy. <laughs> it's called pi over eight. In every book, it's called the pi over eight gate. It's called pi over eight because if you make it with determinant one, uh, these matrices are working up to scale as e to the i pi over eight, e to the minus pi over eight. So it's a rotation like this. It turns out that now if you take this gate and the H gate and you start multiplying these two guys, they become, they will get close to everybody. That's very easy to, what we call topologically dense. So they're universal and the solovay kitayev theorem will say that there's a reasonably short circuit to uh, implement this. But in fact, there's much more that's true. So just last year, this is how I became interested in this, Ross and Selinger, two computer scientists in Canada, uh, found an algorithm to, so what they want to do is they want to write down, approximate any matrix by products of these H and T gates, which these H and T, and they also throw in S, and their argument is that H and S and don't cost anything, the, all the cost is on T. So they're going to ask how many T, uh, do you have to, how many times do you have to apply T to get close to an arbitrary matrix? Okay. So here's my matrix. So the matrix, that I'm giving, showing you an output from the algorithm. I'm going to try approximate e to the i pi over 128, e to the minus i pi, 0, 0. It's a diagonal matrix, and the algorithm only works for diagonal matrices. That's a weakness, but not a completely disastrous weakness. And I want to find a word, so a circuit in H and T, which approximate this up to 10 to the minus 10, or 10 to the minus 20, or 10 to the minus 2,000. And they, they run their algorithm. You can't argue with success. There's no proof here. These are guys who, they have heuristics, why something should work. They check it on many examples. It works. If it works, you can't argue. If somebody factors a number quickly without any proof that says, I'm going to use this heuristic, that heuristic, and then you give them a big number and they factor it, you keep quiet. So here, it works exactly like that. You want to find a very good approximation to this by a short word where we only count the number of t's in this word. And quite incredibly, they find this word, which they write down, which has got t count 102, and I'll explain what optimal is in a sense. It's very close to optimal, and it's showing something very good is happening. And then you try approximate any diagonal, but in, let's take the same guy and just approximate it much better, 10 to the minus 20. And in this case, they find a word of length 200 and 198 is optimal. Then 10 to the minus 2,000, they find a word of this length. And, and the running time is very quick on, a, on any machine. So they have some quite incredible algorithm which shows that these H and T gates, which are in every book, actually can be uh, are penetrating all of U2, the SU2, or SU2, the unitary group on two elements, in the way that I want with very short circuits. This is quite incredible. I'll tell you what the algorithm is in a second. I'm doing okay, all right. Okay, what's this got to do with sums of squares? This is, everything is about sums of squares. Yeah, and the algorithm is about sums of squares. And we're just going to ask a more subtle question before we were just asking which numbers are sums of squares. Now I'm going to ask which numbers are sums of squares. We have some side conditions because I'm trying to approximate a unitary matrix. So the field, this is why I introduced those fields in these questions. The field is going to be Q root 2 and the integer Z root 2. And I want to write 2 to the H as a sum of four squares, but I emphasize again that these numbers X are integers over here. They have the form A plus B root 2. Now we discussed that we can answer that question of whether there is a solution or not. And we understand this. These numbers are represented as a sum of four squares in many ways. And in fact, the Ziegel mass formula will tell you basically how many ways. Now, what these guys show is something, some other people, another bunch of computer scientists, these fellows here, uh, Klauch, Nikov, <laughs> Maslov, and Moscow. I'm going to meet them all next week, by the way, two weeks' time, in the year before. This is not too surprising. Uh, if you take those H and T gates, this is how this came about. The H, remember, was the other mod gate. It was 1 over root 2, 1, 1, 1. So I'm dividing by 2 or by root 2. So I'm at least dividing. I've got fractions of 1 half somewhere. 
The other thing I'm doing is I'm multiplying by e to the i pi over 4. So I'm not working just with ordinary whole numbers. I'm working with integers in a number field. So the matrices that you'll start multiplying in all these textbook gates will lie in some number ring. And these guys show exactly which number ring they lie in. In other words, if you take the solutions to the sum of four squares here with h up to t, and you, for each solution to this Diophantine equation that we were interested, whole number equation over integers in this ring, and associate the two by two unitary matrix, i is the square root of minus one, yeah, you can check that this thing actually has determinant one. I'm dividing by two to the h over two, so that this will have length one, so the determinant here will be one, and that will be unitary. This transformation actually has a miraculous feature, that the number of t counts in writing when you write this, uh, this matrix as a product, these, these matrices you get, you know, exactly the matrices that you can write down as products of H and T and S, and the number of T counts is exactly the number a, H is less than or equal to T here. In other words, there's a 1-1 correspondence in terms of the capital T count of the solution to sums of four squares and these guys. Quite remarkable. And how they found this just by hand because they just were working with these gates. Of course, there's a reason, and I'm going to tell you what it is in a second. In fact, I've just written a long letter explaining all these things, and I'll give you the reference at the end. So the question now of approximating an arbitrary unitary matrix by one of these boils down to, I'm writing a numbers x1 squared plus x4 squared in this number ring is 2 to the h. I divide by 2 to the h. This has now got length 1, so I'm really talking about numbers on the unit sphere in four dimensions. I have about 2 to the h points. And the miracle we're looking for here is that these 2 to the h points should cover the sphere completely uniformly and optimally. Because then each guy would be doing the optimal job that when I took the small neighborhood, I just have exactly one or a few guys there, which are the short words we're looking for. So they don't know how to prove this, but they are finding this numerically because they do a lot of experiments. Turns out that, again, at Stanford, when Lubotsky was visiting here in 1998, 1988, sorry, <laughs> he was visiting here and, was the, uh, and Ralph Phillips was a colleague of ours at the time, and I did, wrote probably more papers with him than anybody else. We were doing something very similar. We showed uh, this, these examples that I've been talking about here, all special cases of what we constructed. We had no idea about quantum computation. But we showed, and I show in this letter how to improve our results so as to cover this optimal statement. We show that uh, using the theory of quadratic forms, re representing 2 to the h as a sum of four squares, but not just the theory of existence, but in also in terms of how well you can approximate any number, and in particular using something very uh, powerful called the Ramanujan conjectures, we showed that in fact these points that you're constructing here cover the sphere completely optimally, most points. That is to say that the points you're putting on this three sphere by this construction with these H and T gates uh, miraculously are placing themselves optimally so as to have a complete optimal arrangement. This is what I was saying before, what optimal was. So these gates are completely golden. You can't do better than them, and this theorem shows, once you apply it in this context, that there are always short words and optimally short words, and I call them, that's the title of this lecture, golden gates. But it's completely useless to a computer scientist unless you can find the short word. So the existence is something mathematicians love proving, and we suffer and we prove it. And I'm telling you, these work, but I don't know how to find them quickly. But that's what Ross and Selinger found. They have an algorithm, and I'll end by explaining the algorithm, just the beginning of the algorithm. And you must panic. There's a beautiful theorem of Len Edelman and Manders Edelman from RSA, which says, and when you see this theorem, you might say, gee, I'm not going to find a quick algorithm. He says, the question of solving a Diophantine equation, much simpler than what I've been telling you about. I've been telling you about a quadratic equation. That's where all of these had powers of two. But here I'm looking just at a parabola, ax squared plus by plus c equal to zero. Suppose I want to know whether that has a solution where a, b, and c are positive integers, and I want to solve. I give you a, b, and c, and in terms of the number of digits, that's what polynomial means, you're supposed to find me x and y. 
Can you find an X and Y quickly? Now, theoretically, we can understand this very quickly. This problem they show already in 1978 is what's called NP-complete. It's as difficult as the most difficult problem, uh, polynomial problem. So if you can solve this, you can show P equals NP if you can find a quick algorithm to do this. This is already as hard as the most difficult problem. All the difficult problems which are in the same NP class. It's quite shocking because it looks like this shouldn't be a hard problem. It's quite striking. So when you see that, you say, wait a minute, you're not going to find a short circuit because I'm now trying to find a good approximation. Well, Ross and Selinger, and I'll show you the algorithm in end, they show that there's a random polynomial time based on all sorts of heuristics which about primes and anything that comes their way, which is polynomial in T, which means polynomial in log of 2 to the T in solving that equation, which when it stops, and apparently it stops, in every example they've done, produces essentially this very short circuit that Lubotsky, Phillips, and I know exists, and which is completely optimal. So for diagonal matrices, the world is really golden. In other words, you cannot put better, there may be other arrangements, but they'll never be any better than this, and this uh, is completely optimal. It's uh, quite, quite remarkable that you could do something like this. So this is the, what Ross and Selinger prove, and let me just end with the algorithm. It's the beginning of the algorithm, because it bring me back to Fermat. So I want to find a solution to x1 squared. So, so far, we were just talking about existence of solution. Now I want to find a solution which is approximating some numbers. And the diagonal statement that they had there was that I'm going to try and make x1 close to alpha, x2 close to beta, x3 close to zero, that's the diagonal, x4 close to zero. I'm going to try to find an integer solution to that. And how can we do that quickly? And quickly means polynomial, not in 5 to the h, but in h, so log of the right-hand side. So the, the algorithm is quite simple. I'll just show you the starting point. Let's just choose x1 close to alpha. Alpha is a real number. Alpha squared plus beta squared is 5 to the h because it's on the sphere. So just choose the, uh, the closest integer. That's easy enough. The integer part plus a small integer, which I'm going to vary. And beta to be the integer part of beta plus l. And then check if 5 to the h minus the sum of these two numbers that we just found is a sum of two squares. So we're back where Fermat was. Which numbers are sum of two squares, and can we find the solutions quickly? Well, Fermat says if this number's prime and congruent to 1 mod 4, there are x3 and x4, but can we find them quickly? Well, let's just contemplate that firstly. Why should it be prime? Okay, well, we're doing computer science now. We're going to vary k and l. This is part of the heuristics that they give. So if, it, if it's not prime, you just change k and l, and you repeat. You only repeat, the, the density of primes is one over log, so you only have to repeat this a few times before you will hit a prime, and in practice you hit a prime. The minute you hit a prime, Fermat tells you there is a solution, and you found x3 and x4, and they're doing a very good approximation job. Well, you say, but how do I find x3 and x4? Well, here comes a remarkable theorem of Rene Scope, which uh, when I was studying here at Stanford as a student, uh, it seemed, when, when I was a student, this looked way out of reach. Uh, I had a student, Jonathan Peeler, who wrote a thesis generalizing this amazing theorem of Scope here at Stanford. He generalized this from this case to what's called uh, a Belian Galois group. Anyway, he shows that this equation, you can find x3 and x4. In Fermat's theorem, you can find x3 and x4 very quickly using elliptic curves. So there's an algorithm which runs, if you want to write p as a sum of two squares, and p is congruent to 1 mod 4, we know by Fermat there's a, it has a solution. He gives an algorithm which has been implemented, by the way, it runs beautifully, in log p to the six steps, that's polynomial, and it finds x1 and x2, or x3 and x4 here. So they run this, and that gives them the good approximation. Now that's not quite done. Uh, yeah, we started, I have two minutes. Uh, that's not quite done because that just gives me this x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared plus x4 squared is 2 to the h in this number ring. I now need to write that as a factorization in terms of h and t. However, there's a structure of the solution set which has to do with factorization of quaternions which works like the Euclidean algorithm and it just allows you to instantly factorize it using some uh, factorization of quaternions or some tree-like structure. I won't go into it, but that was already in the paper of Philip Slobodsky and myself. So once you find this global solution, you find the, the actual factorization into the H and T immediately. 
So I end by saying, remarkably, even in the 21st century, understanding the finer features of sums of squares is of interest to people like me, maybe not more generally. But I think if a quantum computer is ever built and people have to actually build these gates, these are the optimal ones in the 2 by 2 case, and they'll be used in the n by n case. And uh, this is uh, Conrad's final line. <laughs> For mine, Gauss and Siegel might be very surprised. I don't know about that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> if, I, if I may just, there are references here. That I guess I can make them available to anyone. The standard quantum computation book is this. This is the Ross Selinger paper and these computer science papers. This is this remarkable paper of Duke. This is the Hilbert problem. Uh, I want to just mention this. The problem of, uh, of um, Hilbert's 11th problem does not end with just solving f of x equal to m, that is, in matrix notation, x transpose ax equals m. One can write down simultaneous equations, which Siegel's mass formula applies to, x transpose ax equals a symmetric matrix B, not just a one-by-one one matrix. And then we don't know anything this shot. We don't know this complete local to global. But quite incredibly, Ellenberg and Venkatesh improved everything was known in that kind of problem, where the right-hand side is not a scalar, using ideas of Ratner from ergodic theory. I had to get that in. <laughs> okay, thanks. We have time for a few questions. Anyone? Any questions? Yeah, we just knew that we could put points on a three-sphere, which are so damn well equidistributed that nobody could touch them because we were, they were, uh, what's remarkable is roughly, uh, so let me say this algorithm is as good as, the best algorithm in the world, uh, maybe Don Knuth can uh, confirm this, is the Euclidean algorithm, probably the oldest, runs, uh, if you want to approximate a real number by a rational number, you make two transformations. X goes into 1 over X. That's a 2 by 2 projective transformation. And X goes to the integer part of X, a translate. And you just op apply these two, and it gives you the continued fraction. It gives you, and it runs in log of the number of digits to the power one steps, actually. You can't do better than this. There's no better algorithm in number theory than a Euclidean algorithm. What we're looking for here is a Euclidean algorithm in the unitary group SU2. Give me two transformations which have the property that they, you can tell me how to get to any matrix quickly, and they, there's a very short word to get er, to every, almost every matrix, optimally short. And that's what's being produced here. And what Lubotsky, Phillips, and I did then, we, we were, okay, Phillips was an analyst, Lubotsky was an algebraist, and I don't know what I was. I was the intermediate between these two guys. Actually, the guy who was writing all the programs was Ralph Phillips, quite remarkably, checking, because he didn't trust anything we wrote, so he said, I, okay, I'll see if it works. Uh, now, in there, we uh, concentrate on the analysis side of this, which I think might have been a bit misleading for this thing. It was called discrepancy. So our paper is about the discrepancy of putting points on a sphere with a very simple algorithm of just generating new guys from old guys by applying one of three transformations. And we didn't get optimal bounds because the discrepancy is a harmonic analysis question, which is not natural. But this question of the covering radius loses no information. That's what this letter of mine explains. So I've now written a letter updating that, improving what we had there. And for this purpose, it's completely optimal. So we, we, didn't, have, we, didn't, we didn't have this application. We, we, didn't, we just wrote a, a, another paper about what's called Ramanujan graphs, which is a purely combinatorial thing, which is an optimal graph in terms of connections, connectedness and sparsity. And that has been used a lot, but this sort of just died. Uh, if it's in every quantum computer, I think we, wa we want to be back with it. <laughs> now, uh, of course, this is all just the end game. This is the end game of when you make a quantum computer, this will be how best to, which you'll have to decide what gates you want. There may be very physical, serious physical constraints. And w so I believe this pi over eight gate is something everybody's trying to build. 
And incredibly, that lies in this particular number field. How these guys found it is quite remarkable. They just start to multiply these matrices and realize some structure without they're working, we work, Lubotsky, Phillips, and I work backwards. We start with the number theory and we tell you the gates. They start with the gates, and this is the only set of gates that they've managed to kind of jive, and this letter explains why. It's a special case of our construction. Okay, maybe we have time for one more question. Anyone? Okay, well, let's thank Peter again for a wonderful talk. <laughs>